rights and property of black. Moreover, the Panthers used their guns um, as a means to stop police violence against the black community, and this was, of course, per perfectly legal at the time. When the Panthers made their famous demonstration in Sacramento in May of 67, the speech that Huey Newton wrote and Bobby Seale delivered on the cap steps of the Capitol connected the violence of the U.S. government against blacks from slavery to police brutality with the incarceration of Japanese Americans, the dropping of atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, in quotes, the cowardly massacre of Vietnam, and in quotes, the genocide practiced against American Indians. This was the danger of black power, the third world strikers, the Asian American and Chicano movements. The late 60s activists turned the Bring the Boys Home slogan into major critiques of US imperialism in Vietnam and throughout the world and fought for less for integration into the good society and more for self-determination and power. So Aoki does not fit the image of a passive model minority. Instead, he represented a militant menace, if you will, to the establishment. And one way to contain an Asian menace is to turn inscrutable Orientals into agents for the government. So let me be clear, I'm not stating that this was Rosenfeld's intention, but the framing of his book dovetails a little too conveniently with this narrative of the good 60s, bad 60s, and is engaging in a rewriting and a containment of radical history. Um, I want to say this, this last thing about Rose, Rosenfeld's book is that he turns what many of us consider the victory of the Third World Strike at Berkeley into um, something contained by the administration. He talks about how um, the students began to organize in response to Chancellor Hines' efforts to increase African American student enrollment at Cal. Instead of putting it in a more proper historic context in which Black Studies was already being offered at Merritt College, for example, and in which across the, the nation, pe people were studying, uh, fighting for black power and black studies, and there were third world anti-colonial movements going on. <coughs> Rosenfeld also turns the strike victory away from the students and into Chancellor Hines' victory. He says that Hines wouldn't agree to the third world liberation front demand for student control of ethnic studies, so, quote, in a near unanimous record, the Senate, the, the faculty Senate, there were about 550 of them, nearly unanimously voted for the creation of ethnic studies subject to regular campus control. So he gives the victory to the chancellor. Very interesting. I think I'm running out of time, but I want to I take just a few last minutes to make a contrast with the work on the third world um, strike by Professor Harvey Dong at Berkeley. I know Professor Ferreira did, looked at the third world strike here at San Francisco State. Um, Richard, one of the things that Richard does in the framing of this strike in my book is he talks about solidarity. And he says, the issue of organization came up. What do we call ourselves? The third world liberation front. Yay, team. Everyone agreed on that. How are we going to run the strike? What would be the composition of the group? Are the blacks going to lead it? And he said, um, because they're the largest oppressed national minority, um, the Latinos could have counted that the Latino community in California is the largest oppressed racial ethnic community and should lead the strike. Of course, the Asians could have said that there were more Asian students at UC Berkeley. And lo and behold, the Native Americans could have claimed leadership as the most oppressed, suppressed, depressed group. But what, were people, what did people argue? They said, let's do it equally. They said they got that from some of the San Francisco strike third world front leaders. And they, he said, if you can't trust one another, don't even go on strike. And so what happened at the end is that they had equal representation by blacks, Chicanos, Asians, and Native Americans. So this is part of, even though Richard is always, um, he's been promoted as associated with violence, and, and he, he loved the military maneuvers, he also was very invested in third world solidarity and practiced it. But he also did focus on military maneuvers within the strike. And I actually had a concern that when there's so little written about Berkeley's third world strike, that Richard's story might really shape it as really sort of, you know, all, all of these sort of strategic confrontations with non-strikers and the police and so forth. Uh, when, when there was a lot of grassroots organizing and planning that was also going on that Richard talks less about. 
This is one of the ways Richard talks about this kind of um, militant uh, front line uh, way of organizing. He says, another time, an Alpha member and I were on the picket lines at Sa Sather Gate. He was at one end of the line and I was at the other. I could see that we were going to be hit. I knew that by my end of the line was pretty solid. There were a couple of African Americans there who could hold that in. So I went scooting over to help this opera brother, thinking he may be in trouble. But he apparently had some martial arts training. He had a short little picket sign and he was just cleaning their clocks every time they turned around. I was stunned. Um, but Richard doesn't only talk about it. And this is, I was just on a radio interview this morning and the host asked me, you know, isn't Richard. Wasn't he, didn't he change when in the 1990s he, he talked about withdrawal and support of other kinds of activities and in the 60s wasn't he just hard-nosed militant? And I said actually in the 60s also he was always concerned. When he taught weapons training he was most concerned about gun safety, but he also would get involved with military strategic withdrawals, just like any military you, you know, would do. And Richard says, I remember during a strategic withdrawal all of us were running across campus being chased by, I think it was the highway patrol that day. I was behind two guys. One was Asian and the other African. The Asian American was running so fast his wallet dropped out of his pocket. The African American, without breaking stride, was able to pick up the guy's wallet and kick on going. I said, right on. <laughs> so anyway, the, the, again, the ideas of, of um, solidarity. But he talks in other places more about strategic withdrawal and, and why they did that. And I just want to end by saying that um, something that, that, that is taking up more in Harvey Dong and my own chapter is using the grassroots activist writings, the Asian American Political Alliance newspapers, the interviews with activists. Uh, Rosenfeld did some of this, but Rosenfeld relied largely on the FBI files to give a history of the Asian American Political Alliance. And one of the things that is emphasized in Harvey Dong in my own writings is that self-determination and power were crucial to the third world strikers. Because people said at Berkeley, um, the administration was already working with the black students to develop their black studies proposal. And it is true that the chancellor had worked within the EOP program to um, dramatically increased African American student enrollment from next to none to some 800 students. Um, so people would say, compared to, you know, you guys know about San Francisco State truck, right? And SI Hayakawa, the president, jumping on the sound uh, truck, for example, and pulling out the, the um, amplifier so people couldn't have amplified sound. I guess they needed Occupy, you know, human mics. But, um, you know, and, and S.I. Hayakawa saying, that was the best day of my life since my 10th birthday when I rode a roller coaster, right? Chancellor Hines wasn't that brazen. And he liked to promote himself as someone who was in support of black, increasing black enrollment, supporting black um, studies, their proposal. So why did the Berkeley strikers go on strike? And the students say very clearly that it was for power and self-determination. Well, the administration saw it as very reasonable to work through academic channels. The students said, if you work through academic channels, then students will not have any power in terms of decision making, in terms of the framing of history. Even if you teach ethnic history, how will it be framed, right? In terms of um, the amount of resources being used for community studies courses, and I don't know if it's like this here, but at my campus, students have virtually no say in the running of any department. And that was something that the students at San Francisco State and Berkeley were fighting for. And I think that these are the kinds of radical ideas and radical histories that need to be promoted. And that's why I do my research and have written my book on originality. Thank you.